the doctrines of the kingdom. The number one factor and everything anybody should know as a Christian is um, you understand the value of this kingdom. What do I mean by understanding the value? Everything you have right now, be it that cloth you are wearing, the dress, the longi, whatever else, even the house you live in today, whatever you have, by the time you were acquiring it, you had a choice. Hallelujah. You had a choice. Hardly will you find that the dress or the coat or the whatever you are wearing, it was only one to the shopkeeper. No. We had a choice. Even the house we live in, we had to choose between several of them. We had a choice. And that is why you came up with what you believed was the best. Even the church. I so much get the privilege of listening to our visitors, who usually visit us on Sundays. And even on Sunday I had one, and they usually tell you that um, I was just looking for a church. And because I have, I have gone to the churches we have around, I have gone when we were inviting them for a mission. So I know we have several of them. Some of them you may not even know they exist, but they are here because they are somehow hidden. But those people, they tell me and they tell us, you know, I was looking for a church. And so by the time they find themselves here and you see they have come, someone was looking for a church, that gives it some weight. Because you know we are so many. They don't have our records. They don't have our history. It should be God who has led them here. So what I'm saying is the thing you have, be it whatever you may have acquired, it was as a result of a choice. Because God, since Genesis, have been providing choices for man so that you can choose. Even when he created Adam, he gave him trees, not one. He gave him two of them that were significant. Moja ya kuzama tunda. And God always gives choices. When Cain was about to kill his brother, God gave him a choice. Cain, I can see sin is knocking at the door of your heart. Choose. You know, God gives a choice. Come to Joshua who is saying, as for my house, we will be serving the Lord. Today, choose. God has always given us a choice. Why? Because he created us in his image, and part of his image that we have is what is called a will. Will. And a will helps us to choose what is best. And if God is giving us the message of the kingdom, then there has to be a choice. Anybody following the message of the kingdom, you must have chosen from among many. And that's why we selected two, because they are main. The kingdom message and religion. And so if today someone was to choose the message of the kingdom, what did you use? What, what criteria did you use? What criteria did I use? That is why the first thing is understanding its value. You have with you what you have given more value than what you left. Even if it was a shoe that you were selecting, from the, uh, the shopkeeper, you saw several of them. Apart, uh, among the many reasons why you chose whatever you have is value. I think this shoe has got more value than this one. So the kingdom of God has got value. And it is those who have known the value that of, of the kingdom that have chosen the kingdom message. So I am talking to us as those who have given this message more value than the rest and you are convinced in your heart and mind this is the message that God has chosen for us other than the region so I, allow me to I, I have really so much quoted the book of Matthew because for those that are here and we were together when we began we saw that Matthew uh, is the one who so much talked about the kingdom of God though he was calling it the kingdom of heaven because he was talking to the Jews who had to establish that Jesus was one of them. He, he was a king and he was one of them. That's why you get even the generation of Jesus. So let's read Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 down there. 
Matthew 13, we have come to the parables. Uh, in our Sunday expository sermons, we are going actually, I think from now we have already entered into the parables. They so much describe the kingdom of God. And there are these two parables that Jesus gave. Well, I'm, going, I'm going to have one. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's read both of them. 13 verse 44. And uh, we see the value that Jesus gave. Those that chose to follow the message of the kingdom. And the Bible says, I'm reading from a uh, revised standard version. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Let's read the other one, verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. Whatever the spelling, I mean the pronunciation. Who, on finding one pearl of great value, he went, sold all that he had, and bought it. Those two parables. Jesus is trying to explain to the people what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he's saying how, uh, the kingdom of God is like um, <clears throat> the first one, a treasure. A treasure. We, we had one in a service somewhere that we were fellowshipping and a Nigerian pastor came and said how a man whom he prayed for uh, told him, Pastor, you have helped me so much. I want to gift you with the land. And the pastor inquired where the land is. And he was taken to a very rocky ground. And he was about to reject it. But he said the Lord convinced him that he should not reject the land. And um, at, uh, when the government was doing exploration for oil, oil exploration in Nigeria, they found that oil to be in that land. And uh, he was saying that at that moment he's was one of the very rich guys in Nigeria, though later it was concluded that it was lies. He was lying to us. But that is exactly what Jesus is saying. A piece of land whereby you find treasure in that land. And though in itself the land is expensive, but in it you get some more treasure. And Jesus is saying that it's like when that man discovered that treasure, he first of all covered it up, then he ran, sold everything he had. He came and bought the land. The land which has had treasure, and this treasure was hidden. This treasure was hidden. There is a concept I would want also to go through there. So Jesus is telling us, he was speaking to the people who are used to some good message. Because they were following the law. It is all they knew. That you had to follow the law for you to be blessed. You had to follow the law for you to have favor. But Jesus is saying now that you have discovered something else. What are you supposed to do? Because of the value of the treasure. You don't care anything else you have. Jesus said that that man ran and sold everything else he had identifying very well what I have just said before when I was doing the, uh, so doing the introduction. I said everything you have, you have given it what? Value. Be it that dress, be it a shoe, be it a television you have, you bought it because you knew it had value than the less that you left. But now Jesus is saying, now that you have accrued so many things of value, when you discover the kingdom, you go sell everything and come and buy that land. Jesus was talking about religion. It is time to forsake all that you know about religion. All that you knew about God apart from the kingdom. It is not worth holding it anymore. You sell it. He was teaching these people so that they could somehow come to their senses. And know the kingdom message is what was to liberate them. It is all they needed. And that one made the kingdom of God to them and to us have value than any other knowledge we had. Of course, we had so much of knowledge, even right now, even those people that are there. Right now, actually, if you can hear some people preaching, even today we could hear them, and you, you feel like you want to hide. Some people are now teaching people how God said 
the church, he cannot live in houses made of men. And they go to the scriptures discouraging people to go to these churches where people are being killed. That is a religious message. Jesus is telling us, once we identify the value of this message of the kingdom, you forfeit every other knowledge you had about religion and about God, and you base it now in the new perspective, like we saw last time. That is number one. For anybody to embrace this message, you must understand its value. And now you are able and ready to understand it. You are ready to go to Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seeking is doing all you can to study and understand. Number two, after you understand and you have given it value than anything else, it is now entrance. Entrance. How do we enter the kingdom? Because it's all written in scriptures. The number one thing when we talk about entering the kingdom, Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. This is John the Baptist. He came with the message of the kingdom of God. And he's, he can see so many people coming. And he's explaining to them, I have come with the message of the kingdom. How do you enter? Number two of John, uh, Matthew 3, verse 2, the Bible says, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. That is the basic key to anyone who wants to come into the kingdom. Repentance, the word repentance, it is not remorse. There are three words that we somehow confuse. We have remorse, we have regret, and repentance. When you have done something wrong, and you have messed up, and you feel so bad about it, that is when you are so much remorseful. That is remorse, feeling bad, and that is not repentance. You feel bad that you have messed up. Then we have regret. When you know that you have messed up those people that you love. I've done that to my children. I forgot to buy them this and the other. That is regret. You regret that you have done something bad. And that is why some people, when they want to go and confess their sins to their friends, they say, I regret that I talked without thinking. I regret that I said this, this and this again is you. But repentance is when you identify, acknowledge, and know that the only person that you have sinned is God. That is according to the biblical meaning. You have repentance, true repentance. And repentance, the word repent means a change of mind. Change of mind. You change our mind about what I was doing. There is this I had believed to be true. Now I change my mind. That is what repentance is. And we change our mind in so many things when we identify something better. We repent. We repent. We change our mind. Actually, there's a scripture somewhere in the, uh, in the Bible. God says that I repent I have done this. God is not repenting because he had done wrong. No. Job 34 verse 10 says, far be it from God to do wrong. So when the Bible says that God repented, that he had brought this to the people, it is he changed his mind. He changed his mind. So the first key is to repent. We change our mind. And that's why I'm saying this message was given to people who are so much entrenched into the religion. They believed into sacrificing a, a goat for your sins to be forgiven. They believed in doing so many other rituals for, they, for them to have favor with God. But Jesus is, and John came with the message of repentance. Jesus took it up when he came. He, was, he, told, he told the people to repent. And he, he said to the disciples, go and preach. Tell the people to repent for the kingdom of God has come. Change your mind. Because like we said last time, this message is a kingdom. It's a message of the kingdom. I mean, the, king, the, message, the kingdom message is a message of the mind. There has to be a mental transformation. So, for, for you to enter into the kingdom, there has to be repentance. Then, you have to feed our minds with the word of God. Feeding our minds with the word of God, that is according to Romans chapter 12. The Bible says that, do not be conformed to the pattern 
the rituals we were talking about to the patterns of this world. That is verse 2. Romans 12 verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Be transformed that you may prove what is the will of God. We said last week, how is it, can we know the will of God? It is when we are in the kingdom because the kingdom is in heaven, the will of God is done in heaven, and when the kingdom has come and we are in the kingdom, we cannot easily understand the will of God. And that's why Paul is saying about transformation of our mind. Other versions talk about do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. Pattern. So what is the pattern that people use to pray? What pattern do people use to do acts of kindness to people? Change that mind so that you can understand what the will of God is. So the number two uh, aspect is we stand in the word of God and we be transformed. Then we, have, we go to flexibility and humility. We are into entrance to the kingdom. Flexibility and humility. Matthew 18. Matthew 18, I'm going to rush. Matthew 18, verse 3 to 4. The Bible says, this is Jesus talking, Matthew 18, verse 3 to 4. Truly I say to you, unless you turn, you see the word turning is changing of mind. Unless you turn and become like children, because your body will not become like a child. Where will you turn? The mind. Unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Here Jesus is not comparing or is not contrasting between a sinner and a righteous person. That a sinner will not enter the kingdom. No, he's talking about a person with a mentality of a child and a person with an adult mentality. Anybody who, who has that adult mentality, every moment you hear the word, you question. No, I'm not saying questioning is bad, but you don't have this humility. You cannot change. Someone cannot speak to you. You know, I'm going to quote so, so much those people that I've been hearing about. Today, there was that guy who was telling them that um, you should not have a preacher in your life. He's a believer, by the way, because you have the Bible. Go read the Bible. These preachers are the ones that are really getting us into mess. He was saying that it is bad to listen to a preacher. And he was misquoting. So, and as where we were, we were discussing we were discussing him, how he's failing in the rules of Bible interpretation. Because he's taking one scripture and he's leaving the others. It's like uh, the Makeji guy. You know in Kikuyu that Makenzi is Makeji. That Makeji, he, he is preaching heresy. He's taking one part of scripture, fasting and living along the rest. That becomes heresy and destructive. So Jesus is saying unless you turn, having that very flexible mind, very flexible mind, you cannot enter the kingdom. That's why it is critical that whenever this message is being preached, let your mind get to be like that of a child. You're able to listen, you're able to learn. Also, Matthew 5, 3, in the Beatitudes, Jesus says, Matthew 5, 3, allow me to read fast. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Who are these people that are poor in spirit? Po this is not poverty, a pesa. Which poverty is this? That you consider yourself always to be very desperate to know God more. Always to be desperate to learn about God. You are too much hungry for God. That is, you are poor in spirit. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. Let's get go. Um, into the, the that concept about the practical way of living this message. It is the only message. That is the only message that Jesus left. It is the only message. Matthew 10, verse 7. Jesus has now been with the disciples and he's preparing them to go and preach. Jesus is risking. The message that he has brought is very costly and it you cost him so much after this time because he's going to die on a cross and he has prepared some people here that he want to leave actually jesus is not uh, intending to preach 
so much more than three and a half years. He is not intending to live in this world for more than 33 years. And he is so much, therefore, investing a lot of trust into the disciples. But not so much into them, but also into the message that he is going to give them. So that this message will stick and will remain and accomplish the purposes of God to the end. So that's why it's very critical to understand what Jesus said when he was giving the baton to the disciples. And he's telling them now he was, this is, these are the first times he was preparing them to go and preach. And he's, he's telling them, and preach as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, full stop. It is the only message. Every other doctrine that we study about is born from there. Go preach. And so many other scriptures support that. That it is the only message. This is the message that the disciples preached. This is the message that Jesus preached when he rose from the dead. Because for 40 days when he rose from the dead, he came, for 40 days he walked among the people. The Bible says in the book of Acts, and he was with them preaching the message of the kingdom. When he rose from the dead, meaning it is the only message. I told you that before I died. Now I have died. I am back to life. And it is the only message. It is the only message about the kingdom. The Bible says now, he's giving more instructions after he rose from the dead. The book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8. We are into practicals of the message. He's telling them, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Please get here. Let's move together. You shall receive power when the Spirit will come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So where are we now? To be very precise, we are not in Jerusalem. Us, the physical us, right now, we are not in Jerusalem, we are not in Judea, neither are we in Samaria. We are into what you see there at the rest of that verse, and to the end of the earth. And I want to tell us today that the message of the kingdom was so much to go into those areas. Why? Because the religion had different effects in those, religion, in those regions. So religion in Jerusalem... What, what had it done in Jerusalem? Jerusalem was the epicenter of religion. That is where religion came up. That's where we had the Pharisees. That is where we had the Sadducees. That is where we had the temple. That's where we had the, the, uh, the lambs and the goats being sacrificed. Morning, evening. That's where the feasts were being celebrated. It was the epicenter. Epicenter, I mean like when we have an earthquake. We always have where it, it began, and it has greater effect there. So in Jerusalem, Jesus is very categorical, because these are not the only places we have in Israel. And in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, it had affected, it had as, uh, affected these concepts. Number one, in Jerusalem, religion had affected leadership. That's where we had, when we, you come into the temple, you have the Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, you had the other people, you had the, the Levites, you had the priests, and you had the, the court for other people that are normal. You had the other place where the poor lived and stayed. You have a place, you had a place where the Gentiles, a Gentile could not come close to the temple. So there were so much segmentations. When you, were, you could go to the temple, it's unlike here, if someone would come, unless maybe they think this is the pastor or this is whoever, Someone cannot identify, and they, use, they only see a group of believers or a group of people. But if you could go to the temple, you could see these differences. And Jesus knew that if the disciples and the people will not get the difference between the leadership he has brought and the leadership that is portrayed by the religious leaders, they are going to be, uh, there will be a problem. And so the kingdom message was to affect the leadership that was there of the day. It, so it had to affect uh, the leadership. 
And like Mark chapter 10, this is the, this is the mode of leadership that Jesus leaves. He expects us, like he said in Mark, in Mark chapter 10, verse 42 and 45 to 45. This is what the Bible is saying. And when the 10 heard, let's start from verse, from verse, um, let me read very fast because it's important, from verse 38. But Jesus said to them, these are the disciples who came asking, you know, the mother came and asked about his two sons. Will my son, please, when you go into your kingdom, allow that one of my sons will sit on the right and the other on the left. So this is the response of Jesus. Jesus said to them, verse 38, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Are you to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they say to him, we are able. Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you'll be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, the other disciples now, they began to be indignant about at James and John. And Jesus called them to him. Uh, he called them to him and he said to them, You know that those who are supposed to rule over the Gentiles, they lord it over them. And there are great men exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. That is the kingdom leadership. Hallelujah. So the practical part of it comes to me in the leadership that I have and to you in the leadership that you have. God giving, giving you a chance to lead us and to lead his people wherever. That is the criteria. For you to operate under the kingdom and in the kingdom of God and enjoy the benefits, this is what we should practice. That we should be the servants of those people that we lead. In Jerusalem, it was opposite. And the Romans, of course, were so much again. Uh, were putting a lot of authority over the people that they were leading. And the Pharisees were putting a lot of authority over the people they were leading. And Jesus is saying, now among us, it should not be so. The greater among us should be the servant. Also, in Jerusalem, prayers and fasting were affected. Prayers and fasting were affected. And Jesus did not want his disciples, neither the people that followed him, to copy what was being done in praying. And so Jesus expected that. When the message of the kingdom will go into Jerusalem, it will affect these areas among the people. Prayer and fasting. Jesus thought about prayer in a very different way. Actually, of these things I'm going to talk about that were, that were so much into religion, I'm going to talk about leadership, prayer, about giving, and about worship. Those things were so much affected, and Jesus is introducing new concepts about them because religion and kingdom are very different. All those in all those people, prayer, leadership, giving, and worship, Jesus talked about secret. He said, When you want to pray, do what? Go into the inner room and lock yourself there and pray to your father who is in heaven. Jesus is introducing something because religious people were teaching people how this is what they were doing. They went into the junction and they prayed loud and they made so long prayers and they impressed people. What about fasting? They clothed themselves in a way that everybody knew. Wow, this man really fasts. And they were fasting. There was one Jesus was talking about in, in an example, in a parable, and he was saying that that man went to God and he said, I fast three days a week. That guy should be very religious. That's a person who tries. But Jesus talked about prayer, go into the secret place. What about fasting? Do not show to the people that you are fasting. What about um, leadership? Do not show people that you are a leader. Actually, let them fight you, serving them. What about um, giving? Do not allow what the right hand is giving. Do not allow the left to know. Secret. What about worship? Now it is no longer where you go to worship so that everybody will know. That person goes to worship. No. Worship in the spirit. Why is Jesus bringing in the aspect of secret? 
pray in secret, fast in secret, give in secret. Does it mean we should now never pray while people are seeing and watching us? Jesus is teaching about this thing, about the kingdom principle. That whatever we do from now, if you want to please God, don't do it to impress people. Hallelujah. This is very practical. Whenever you take a chance to pray, please avoid it that you are doing it so that you can impress someone. I have, I'm talking that being a victim in so many times. We could pray. Quoting so many scriptures as if God do not know Titus 2 verse 3. Even further what you have said in Psalm 17 verse 4. And God have saw his Peter that in Revelation 3 verse 2. And I knew somehow in me I want to impress some people. Jesus taught that to be against the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. When you want to fast. I have ever done that. Oh, fasting. I'm in my 30th day. I have ever prayed. I have ever fasted. And people, you, you know, you're going to, you want to make people know that you're fasting. In the moment that we get tempted, na ukiona yesu wa meisema, hii majalibu hiko, na siyo mimi peke yangu, but I'm beseeching us today. Please, because I would want, even if it will begin with us, let us practice this kingdom message. Hallelujah. That we don't do these things to impress people. What about giving? Ah, oh, one day. I went into you know a prayer line and um, I had made a pledge and of to give a lot of money. I, I don't want to give, to say a lot because I don't know how much you, you can call a lot. But to me it was so much. It was in tens of thousands. And so I got it, I put it in an envelope. I made sure I don't give through M Pesa because I wanted the man of God to touch it. And so I remember very well in, on that envelope. You see how you are doing in, in at school, you write a uh, something and then you you made the pen so many times, eh? And so I educated it. And so I gave it to the man of God. So that when he is praying, he should know what is inside. I did not just come here like other people. I'm not empty hearted. Hallelujah. That one is impressing people. Jesus said that should not be among those that will undertake the kingdom. So it's a concept of secret, secrecy. Because Jesus wants you to know you can directly do it to, far, to your father who is in heaven. And he sees in secret. And also Jesus wants to teach us, apart from not impressing people, that God is not anywhere that is too far to be reached. He's right where you are. So you don't have to make me know you are doing it. The father is there. And he wants you to do it to him. Number two, uh, number three concept about that, why Jesus thought that should be done in secret. He taught it that all these things that you have said should be done from the heart. What about prayer? It should come from the heart. What about fasting? Decide in your heart. What about giving? Jesus is saying, whatever your heart will lead you to give. What about um, worship? You should worship with your spirit. Hallelujah. Not impressing people, knowing that your father is there to listen and to receive it. And number three, because you should do it with the heart. So on Sunday, I was being impressed when the pastor was uh, reading Colossians chapter 3, verse, 20, verse 15 down there. And it was actually a verse that I was to read today about these things. Where the Bible says that in whatsoever thing you do, do it unto and to God. That's a kingdom message. That's why God wants to involve your heart so much. So in Jerusalem, prayers were affected, but Jesus taught them how to pray. In Luke chapter 11 verse 1, I'm not going to read because of time, Luke chapter 11 verse 1, the disciples saw Jesus praying so many times, and he had seen the spiritual leaders pray. They had seen them fast, but now here comes a man very short time we are with this man and we can see the effect of his prayers and he came to them and the disciples one of them came and asked him jesus can you teach us how to pray these people knew how to pray a jewish boy knew how to pray since he was three years old he knew how to call god and to pray but 
And these disciples are adults. But they tell Jesus, teach us how to pray. Why? Because they are tired of prayers that have no effect. Hallelujah. That's why G James is emphasizing, saying, that the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and what? Effective. Yes, I am prayerful. But please, can I show you the effect of that prayer? Prayers are not some... Yes, I prayed for six hours. I, there, was, there was that time you were praying for six hours continuously. Now, to look at to Nagaridiana, sir. Now, how you stop? Nazima to Geomba. To know about Skumzima. But now, the question is not on the quantity. It's on the effect of prayers. Do you know of the, all the prayers that are in the Bible? The prayers that are in the Bible, none of them exceeds five minutes. Not that we should not pray beyond five minutes. But Jesus is teaching something. That when you are praying, you should understand your identity. Who are you? That's why he's, he's teaching. That's what he's teaching them in Luke chapter 11. Our Father who is in heaven. That was the first time a Jew was hearing that God can be called Father. It was the first time. Other times in the Old Testament, it was only mentioned as typology. When God was saying, I am like a father and you are like my children. I am like a husband and you are like my wife. But never was it directly hard that God can be a father to anyone. And that is why I said even like in Islam, they cannot comprehend that God can be called a father. And they say he has no son and all that. So that was the Jewish mentality. So Jesus is telling them for the first time, say, our father who is in heaven. Hallelujah. And that one was identity, to give them an identity. That you have children, yes. How do they come to you? I want you to be going that way to God. Number two, who is in heaven, uh, our father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. He is now bringing an aspect of the name. And I have said last time that I want to, to talk about two things that are so much ingrained in the kingdom message that we cannot assume. And number one is citizenship and the name of Jesus. The citizenship. So Jesus is leading them to understand us from today. You have to know that your father is in heaven and he's giving you his kingdom so you also become his citizens. You are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Once the kingdom of God comes, and it is the same kingdom there, you now become citizens of heaven. And he taught them this concept of prayer that was so much contrary to what they knew earlier. And um, in, the, in the prayers, he taught them about how to control these things that I'm going to say today to us. Um, you, there, was, there had to be identity, Number two is humility. When you go to pray from today, be humbled. Be humbled. Because, and Jesus gave them the, the example of the Pharisee and the tax collector. That one day a Pharisee went to pray. And a tax collector went to pray. The Pharisee said, I fast three days a week. I give everything, the tithe of everything. Jesus said then, the tax collector, a sinner, he said, oh, I'm not even worthy to, to look unto heaven. Um, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus asked them, asked them. Who went home with his prayers answered and it was obvious the harbored person so it is a concept that jesus is introducing that was not there so when you pray you must have you know your identity that you are a child of god number two the humility aspect and number three is the sincerity you avoid pretense luke chapter 20 verse 47 let me read that luke chapter 20 allow me to read that verse 47 this is what the Bible is saying. Watch and hear something from verse 46, 47. Beware of the scribes who like to go about in long lobes and love salutations in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Avoid pretense in prayers. When you are not happy, don't tell God, Father, we happily come before you. You are not happy. If you are not happy, you are not happy. If you are not, if your heart is in pain, go that way. Hebrews 10 from verse 19 says that we let's go to God with a sincere heart.
Can we practice that? Let us be sincere. Hallelujah. Even when you are praying for me, this person here, and you don't so much like him, let God know it. Father, I'm praying for Masharia, but please, you know my heart, I don't so much like him. Because of one, two, three. That is sincerity of heart. And that is what will make your prayers very effective, by the way. Hallelujah. And you, you are the Father, just help me. I feel that I'm getting angry. Help me, Father. Sincerity. Then, forgiveness. Mark 11, 25. You must consider forgiveness in your prayers. Let me read that also very fast. Mark 11 and verse 25. We are into practicals. Practicals. Verse 25, the Bible says, And whenever you start praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. When you start doing what? Praying. So you must identify yourself to be a son. You also must be very sincere. And you also have to be humble before God. And also don't um, forgive. Forgive when you pray. Forgive. Okay. That, was, that also affected so much the, um, what was happening in Jerusalem. And that is why Jesus is saying, my house. This is the place he went with a whip. And he whipped all those people. Get out of this place. This house should be the house of prayer. It is written that my house should be the house of prayer. So what kind of prayers do you think they had already done? Because before they entered the temple, they had to pray. Jesus is saying all that was robbery. Plus whatever they were doing, it was not at all reflecting to God as prayers. Jesus now is teaching how to pray. And so when you go, it's telling the disciples, when you go, go to Jerusalem first. They had to encounter all this. And they had to correct the doctrine. Then we go to giving. Giving was so much done the wrong way. According to Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 and 4. Matthew 6, 1 to 4. He says how we should give. Be aware of practicing your piety before men in order to be seen by them. The impression we were talking about. When you give... It is not unto man you should show. You should do it to God. And I thank God because of how we practice it here. It, it's, it's not unto us to know how much you have and you have given to God. Let it be between you and God. It has to be of a willing heart. And you should be moved by love. Remember this is what we said last time. In anything we do in the kingdom of God, you have to be moved by the love you have for God and the love you have for us. If it is anything else, don't give. You know, I was to make the statement the pastor made when he stood here. But I said, let me spare it. That if you are not feeling that you love God to give or to do something, and you don't love us, please, please stop it. Just stop it. It will be okay. If I'm given a chance to preach here, and at that time I feel that I don't love you people, I should just excuse myself. Otherwise, that will be pretense. It is not anywhere to be recorded by God in it, uh, about a kingdom work. And um, then we have got worship. Then about giving, let me say this. That in the New Testament, it is the giver who defines the gift. It is you who determines with your heart. Right now, Father, you have done me so well. Let me give you a thank offering. That's why in our envelopes, you have all those options because it's the, the believer is a Christian who defines the offering. If you want to bless anybody, it's you who indicate this is a love offering. It is not from a pastor. It is not from any of us to dictate to you that right now I want you, you must bring a thank offering. You must bring it here. You must, today you must give for mercy ministry. No. It is you who defines what you want to give. If you want to give for mercy ministry, you do it. That is the New Testament way of doing it. Last three, it's about worship. It's about worship. That I know how worship is done in Jerusalem and in those places. I know how it is done, but it should be different. Allow me to go back a bit. That go and preach the message in Jerusalem. And have said Jerusalem was so much affected in leadership, in prayers, in all those areas you said. Also go where? Judea. What was significant in Judea? 
in those days, remember Judea, in the Judean desert, it is where River Jordan goes through, in the Judean desert, and that is where Jesus went to be baptized. And before Jesus was baptized, there were other people who had come to be baptized, according, uh, as you can see in the book of Matthew. And these people, when they came in Judea, that's in the desert of Judea in Jerusalem, to be baptized, John had a very rough time. Because these people do not understand, my message is different. It's about the kingdom. And they want to be baptized while still in the religion. And he was telling them, surely, you guys, do you understand why you have come here? And that's why the policemen could ask, John, what do we do now? What do we do? Yes, you are also conflicting us. What do we do? And he's telling them, this is what I want you to do. First of all, repent. Change your thinking, the way you are doing things. Nini policy. You have been taking bribes as the way of survival and having an extra coin. Change your mind from today. Repent. From today, do what? You get the concept now. They were coming to John with a religious mentality and John could not baptize them because his message was different. It was the message of what? The kingdom. Praise be to God. And when the Pharisees came, he had to make them change their mind first. And he spoke about them. And he spoke to them. He told them, you brood of vipers. Who has told you you can run away from the condemnation that is coming? Because they, they did not so much understand. They thought baptism was an easier way to get into the kingdom. But he was telling them, you must change your mind. So that was in Judea. So Judea, they had a problem of repentance. They didn't know so much about how to do it. And this is also, when you read about Judea, Jesus was to be killed so many times in Judea. And that's why he had to go back to Galilee, his home place. He also told them, go to Samaria, or Samaria. What was in Samaria? Go take the kingdom. The Samaritans were those people that were hated and despised because they, it was a crossbreed of Jews and Gentiles. And you could not even go through that place. They believed when you go through Samaria, you have defiled yourself and you had to wash your feet. Jesus says to the disciples, go there to that village and preach about the message of the kingdom. The message of kingdom, like we said, it cannot be separated. They are synonyms with the love. You cannot purport to preach the message of the kingdom. We cannot purport to hold on to the message of the kingdom if we negate love. And so, go to those people that are hated. Preach to them. And the disciples also knew. In Samaria, they had a problem about worship. Remember the Samaritan lady in John chapter 4? She was so much religious. She knew this is the mountain that our fathers told about us to worship. Mount Gerizim. And she's questioning Jesus. Jesus, you are telling me about receiving, a, uh, receiving some water. Who gave you, you know, what, something, uh, the jerry can to, to fetch water? What is that water you're talking about? Jesus is trying to introduce the message of the kingdom to her. She's not comprehending. She's not getting it because she has a problem about to worship. And she's saying, first, Jews and Samaritans, we don't have any relationship. Number two, you, you purport to worship in Jerusalem. As for us, we worship on these mountains. And Jesus says, the days are coming and here they are. The true worshipers will worship God in truth and in spirit. Hallelujah. And about worship, there is a little bit of something I would want to mention within two or three minutes about worship. Because it's critically important, I believe so. In the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, I, I read it, I think it is Leviticus, I think chapter 11. Because of time, let me not go there, but you can check it. God said, when you come to bring me an offering, let's say wheat, let's say something, also include, do not burn it with honey. Do not burn it, offer it with honey, but offer it with something called frankincense, like we said here another time. Give it with frankincense. Frankincense, there is that tree. I wish you had time, we could also be, have it displayed here. That tree that Frankins, where Francis comes, comes from, and when you go, you're going to have it, it is something that is very precious, and it is so much layer to find. 
And that is what God is saying. When you come to bring an offering, bring it with frankincense, but avoid honey. So if it is burning grain, do not burn it with honey. Do you know how honey looks like when it is burnt? It turns black. It comes, turns thick. Something that is terrible. What about frankincense? It is not attractive to look at, but when it is burnt, you want to get your nose there. What about honey? Very attractive to look at, very tasty to taste, but when it is burnt, it gets into problems. God is saying, because those offerings that were given to him in the Old Testament, they were symbolic of worship. So God, why is God refusing honey in his worship? Why should it be, not be burnt? God is into something. God is into sincerity of heart. God is not so much happy when I explain to him and call him so many good and nice names, telling him how I love him with my words that are so sweet, while it is not coming from my spirit. Hallelujah. Let me give an example. And this goes so much to ladies, because especially those that are married or those that are dating currently. If your man tells you how much he loves you, what is the next thought that comes to you if not testing those words? So you could test. You have to test. It was very funny until I understood this concept. That those very moments that I, I talked to my wife about this, and maybe if it, I'm just joking over the phone, and I express that, you know, I'm loving and missing. She always remembers what I've not done. Now, I was talking about love. That is how sincerity is being tested. Every proof of belief, I mean, every claim of belief in this world is tested. So, whenever we tell God we love Him, because we do, God, like women, He responds to that. He wants to know the authenticity of that love. And that's where, from where he demands something. Not necessarily physical, not necessarily whatever. Because God is not so much into honey. He's into frankincense. Hallelujah. Yeah, it's not so, those so good things that we bring. It is not the money that I bring here. God wants to know how much do I have. Yeah, I think that's a tree that produces many. Frankincense, very layered, a desert tree. And God says, that is what you should be giving with every offering. Whenever we claim to Jesus to love him, he must test our hearts. That one is for a guarantee. How do we love God? How much do we love him? Last time we said, we quoted the scriptures. Jesus says, you should love the Lord, your God, with all your heart. So any moment I claim to love God, he says, okay. Okay. How much of his heart is in my love? And there comes the testing of a believer. We have to live in this testing now and then because we claim, we make this claim. So it is good whenever we are offering to God worship. I do not want so much to go into singing, but it is there. Whenever we are doing songs, it has to come from the heart. Much about praising and thanksgiving, it comes from the mind, which is okay. We pray to God, we thank him because of what he has done, and we count it. But worship so much goes into the spirit. I mentioned something else about the spirit. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is saying, don't you know that when you connect yourself with a prostitute, you become one body, one flesh with, he, with her. But when you connect yourself or when you are you are one uh, he says let me not misquote that because he's saying about being one in the lord you become one spirit yeah but when you're one with the lord you become one spirit with the lord it is when people are one in the flesh there is productivity true when people become one when the people know each other and they become one in the flesh husband wife a child is born. It is when we become one in spirit with Jesus and it is during worship there is productivity. The worship that comes right from the spirit. And so when I'm conducting worship here, either through prayers or through giving, I should so much connect people, allow people's spirits 
to do it to God. So when I'm singing, when I'm reading songs, or I'm asking us to worship through words, it should get there. I should not just make people to have it in a honey way, so much tasty, to tell God those sweet words if at all the heart and the spirit is not involved. So the Samaritans had that problem, but Jesus made it clear that from now onwards, worship is from the heart. Hallelujah. Then in the uttermost parts of the earth, as I finish, oh, if you can read Romans chapter 1, Paul is addressing us now that the message one day will go. Yes, I have died. Only in Jerusalem I'm known. Maybe Kidogo Kidogo in Samaria and Judea. But I want you to go to the uttermost parts of the earth. And God in you one day, the message you get to Nairobi. And actually not to Nairobi because this is not where I got born again. In those interior parts, Jesus knew what will confront the person and the message of the kingdom. That when the, the message you'll get, get to me when I am already into customs and traditions of men. That is what so much affects the Gentiles. And if you read uh, Romans chapter 1, I'm not going to read because of time, but near the end, Romans 1 near the end, the other the parts of the earth and us in Nairobi, in Kikuyu, in wherever, it is the customs and the traditions. That right now, people don't worry. So long as you want them to get saved as they continue doing whatever else they do according to their culture. That is how much the kingdom message is being affected. Go and preach this message to those people who pray facing Mount Kenya, who pray, you know, doing many things. They will do that. But it is not because they are being affected by the message of the kingdom. It is because of the... Yes, they will pray to God, but they will incline so much into their culture. And because of time, I will not get past there. But I hope we have understood it, that culture... If right now you are fighting anything, whenever the message of the kingdom is given, you are fighting culture and traditions of men. And this is where we have gotten into witchcraft. Because people want to connect it to the spirit world. People believe a human being like you and me who has got flesh, there is an extent they can help you. Unless you go into the spiritual world. And th that, those beings that live in the spiritual world they are the ones who can help those people who are in the physical world. And that is why people are doing so many things so that they can access the spirit world. And that way they get help. That way you get it into a gentle world. That's why we are too much faced with mediums. People who are calling dead people, the spirit of the dead people, to come and help them. So whenever you hear of anything of the sort, you know you are confronting the spirit of religion which has now been preached to people who are into customs and their traditions. And you're going to be faced with these things. You want to marry, you're going to be faced with these things. And it's up to you to decide which side to stand. The side of the kingdom or the other side. The Bible says the message of the kingdom is not a matter of talk like we are talking. It's about power. Hallelujah. So people through religion wants power. And that's why they practice witchcraft and other things. But our message, this simple message, I was liking it when Paul was saying, I'm not going to be ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God to save man. This is the simple message that brings power. When you are given a chance to pray or when you want to pray in your house, whenever you want to pray, practice this. Know you have a daddy. Be sincere to God. Hallelujah. When you are giving here or wherever else, know that you are doing it to God. Let's do it from the heart. Even if we be the people that are going to begin this among a society that is has, having these conflicts, let us do it the kingdom way. Given a chance, let's do it the kingdom way. And because we are citizens to the kingdom. Lastly, I mentioned this because I had said I'm going to mention about it. Jesus told the disciples that when you pray, pray in my name. What, how does the name of Christ work? It is like a card. You go to a wedding banquet or you go to a party and you are given a card of a superior person who is known. Like those people who go to state house for those dinners when they are, there is a celebration. 
They carry with them a card that gives them access. And anyone who asks you, why are you here? You produce the card. The name of Jesus gives us that access into the kingdom of God and everything therein. So whenever we are, being pray we are praying using the name of Jesus, it is not the many times we mention, no. It is that I know I have Jesus and I have that name. And because and through that name, I want to access this healing. I declare, you, even you go to the kingdom of Satan to terrorize them with that card. So from today, it's not unto who are you. It is the name you carry. Hallelujah. Shall we pray together? Blessed Father and great King of all kings, we have all before you to have received that message with humility like little children. Father, you know us. And you know the ability of each one of us to understand and practice this message. We pray that you guide us and help us to be the pioneers of a great move where the power of God will not be hard to be accessed. And that we shall fight any form of religion other than the form that you said we should practice of helping the poor and the orphans and the widows. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your power. In Jesus' name we pray.